Good evening and welcome to Tri-City Baptist Church. Thank you so much for visiting with us this evening as we remember our Lord's sacrifice on the cross. Today is Good Friday, and this is the day where we celebrate his death for us. And I hope if you have any questions about why Jesus died or, or why we would celebrate his death, that is, over the course of this service, those questions would be answered. And if you do have any questions at the end, please feel free to speak with one of our pastors in the lobby. Um, we, all of our pastors, for the most part, will be involved in the service. We will alternate between reading scripture as well as singing appropriate hymns that focus our minds and hearts on Christ and his sacrifice. We will also be partaking of the Lord's Supper. Now, as you came in, you probably passed the tables located here, but you may not have noticed them. And on those tables are some small little communion cups that have both a wafer and juice. So if you did not get one of those and you'd like to participate with us in the Lord's Supper near the end of the service, we do have those available. You can slip out and pick one up, or if you just put up your hand, we have men who can bring one to you. So just feel free to do that if you need that. Thank you so much for visiting. If you are a first time visitor, or if it's been a great while, stop by the Welcome Center. We have a gift for you. Our pastor has written a book of hum called Colorado Snow, and it has some humorous stories of their move to Colorado. We also have some information on the church, some gospel literature, some candy bars, and I'm sure you need all of that, but if you just stop by and pick that up, if you would, fill out the card in the seat back pocket in front of you and drop that off at the Welcome Center on your way out. We would have a record of your visit. Again, we wanna thank you for being with us. Let's start with a word of prayer as we turn our hearts and attention to Christ and his sacrifice. Father, thank you that you sent Jesus to take our place. He died an innocent death not for his own sins, but for ours. And it is finished. Father, thank you that what we could not do, being helpless and bound in our sins, Christ did once for all. He paid that sin penalty so that we might be freely forgiven. Lord, as we come this evening, may we remember him. May we focus our minds and hearts on his sacrifice, and may we rejoice by faith in his finished work. In Christ's name we pray, amen. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Matthew 26. We'll be reading through Matthew 26 and 27 throughout this service. Each one of our pastors will be taking a portion. You can feel free to follow along, or if you just prefer to sit and listen, Please do so. Matthew 26. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings that he said to his disciples, you know that after two days is the Passover and the son of man will be delivered up to be crucified. Then the chief priest, the scribes and the elders of the people assembled at the palace of the high priest who was called Caiaphas and plotted to take Jesus by trickery and kill him. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. And when Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him having an alabaster flask of very costly fragrant oil, and she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. But when his disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this fragrant oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. But when Jesus was aware of it, he said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, but me you do not have always. For in pouring this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? 
and they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. So from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. Now on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying to him, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and they prepared the Passover. When evening had come, he sat down with the 12. Now, as they were eating, he said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful, and each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? He answered and said, He who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? He said to him, you have said it. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Pastor Larry, if you'd come. Thank you, Pastor Nathan. As we begin reading Matthew chapter 26, we see the events of the Passion Week unfolding. Uh, and this these verses, the, the plot to kill Jesus, the foreshadowing of his burial with the anointing by the woman, and then Judas's arrangement, his deal with the chief priest to betray Jesus, and then the solemn occasion of the Last Supper, as we would refer to it, the Passover feast with the disciples. We're going to sing together number 102, I Stand Amazed in the Presence of Jesus the Nazarene. Verse 2 says, no tears for his own griefs, knowing all that was going to about to transpire for Jesus, and yet his concern, his passion was for us. All I can say, left to say, and praise to him is how marvelous, how wonderful. May that be our song of praise tonight. Let's stand together and sing number 102. Sweat drops of blood for mine. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. He took my sins and my sorrows, he made them his very. Savior's love for me. When 
you, you may be seated. I'll continue reading Matthew chapter 26, beginning at verse 30. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered and said to him, Even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you that this night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time he went away and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pay, uh, pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away again and prayed a third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners." Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now his betrayer had given them a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him. Immediately he went to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus said to him, friend, why have you come? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And suddenly one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword, struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. But Jesus said to him, put your sword in its place for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? How then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? In that hour, Jesus said to the multitudes, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I sat with you teaching in the temple and you did not seize me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. We're going to sing together now the wonderful hymn, Jesus Paid It All. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20 says, You are bought with a price, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus paid it all. Let's remain seated as we sing together these stanzas now. Oh, to God. 
As we continue reading, we'll complete uh, Matthew chapter 26, beginning in verse 57. And those who had laid hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance to the high priest's courtyard, and he went in and sat with the servants to see the end. Now the chief priests, the elders, and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. But at last, two false witnesses came forward and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said to him, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God, Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, It is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, Hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look, now you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? They answered and said, he is deserving of death. Then they spat in his face and beat him. And others struck him with the palms of their hands, saying, prophesy to us, Christ, who is the one who struck you? Now Peter sat outside in the courtyard. And the servant girl came to him saying, you also were with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before them all saying, I do not know what you are saying. And when he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, this fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But again, he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. A little while later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, surely you also are one of them, for your speech betrays you. Then he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. Immediately, a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the words of Jesus, who had said to him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went out and wept bitterly. As we consider what happened in Peter's life, it's easy for us to look at that life and to say, oh, I would never do that. And yet as we come before the Lord this evening and we remember his sacrifice on the cross for our sins, we have to be, if we're honest with ourselves, we have to be we have to realize there have been many times in our lives that we have. We have uh, not spoken up uh, during the time when we heard his name blasphemed. We have not followed him and done his will. We've chosen our own ways. And so this evening, let us come together in prayer, going before God individually as well as together as a congregation, confessing our, our sins before him and preparing ourselves uh, to share in the communion later on. Let's pray. Lord, as we come to you this evening, 
and we read the story of Peter, in some ways we look at it and we say, how could he do that? And yet when we consider our own weaknesses, our own flesh, we realize we too could be there. Maybe we haven't directly denied knowing you, but Lord, how many times in our lives have we denied it in action? Have we denied it by remaining silent when we could have spoken up? When we could have defended you and your word? When we could have said something when others were using your name in a blasphemous way? And yet we remain silent. How many times, Lord, in our lives have we known what you would have us to do? And yet we chose not to do that. Or... We knew we shouldn't be doing that, and yet we chose to do it anyway, knowing that we were sinning against you. And Lord, as we consider this, we realize Peter's not alone. We're there with him. As we come to you this evening, Lord, help us. Help us to be humble before you. We heard earlier how Christ humbled himself before you. We know that as he prayed, he did not pray that his will would be done, but that your will would be done. Lord, forgive us for the many times in our lives when we choose our will over yours. When we choose to do that which we know grieves the Holy Spirit, which we know is in opposition to your word. Lord, help us in thought and in deed to honor you and to glorify you in the way that we live. Forgive us for failing to live a life that is pleasing to you. Forgive us, Lord, for putting worldly desires before heavenly desires. Lord, forgive us for not seeking those things which are above. As we come to you this evening, Lord, we are so thankful for the cross. We are so thankful for your son who not just came to earth to show us how to live, Lord, he came to die for us. And we realize that if it was just any one of us, he would have come. How much greater it is that it was all of us. And Lord, as we think, consider tonight the fact that our sins were placed on him and that he willingly allowed himself to be separated from you for that time, that he might bear our sins. Help us, Lord, to recognize the gravity of sin. Help us, Lord, to never dismiss it, rationalize it, excuse it. Lord, help us to always remember when we sin, it is those sins that put Christ on the cross. We thank you so much for his love for us demonstrated on the cross. And Lord, I pray that tonight, help us not only to be humble before you confessing our sins, but Lord, also help us to be repentant in spirit and desirous to demonstrate our love for you in the way that we live our lives. Help us, Lord, to love you in thought and in deed. We thank you so much for the work of Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. The hymn we're going to sing next, you may recognize with a different text in our hymn books, Spirit of God, descend upon my heart. We're going to sing a powerful, a different text to this same tune, I Plead for Grace, which is based upon Psalm 51, David's prayer of repentance. Stanza one of this poem, this song we're going to sing, is based on verses one through four of Psalm 51. Second stanza on verses four through nine. Third stanza, verses 10 through 13. Stanza 4, verses 14 through 17. Stanza 5, verses 18 and 19. And we'll conclude with a summary stanza and stanza number 6. But as we sing, carefully focus on this text and make it your prayer along with David as we sing together now. I plead for grace. <laughs>
Matthew 27, when morning came, all the chief priests and elders of the people plotted against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, what's that to us? You see to it. And he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. But the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, it's, it's not lawful to put them into the treasury because they are the price of blood. And they consulted together and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Therefore, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, 
And they took the 30 pieces of silver, the value of him who was priced, whom they of the children of Israel priced, and gave them for the potter's field as the Lord directed me. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said to him, It is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he answered him not one word, so that the governor marveled greatly. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to releasing to the multitude one prisoner whom they wished. And at that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Who do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that they had handed him over because of envy. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent to him, saying, Have nothing to do with that just man. For I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, What then shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said to him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, saying, let him be crucified. And Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising. He took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I'm innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And all the people answered and said, his blood be on us and our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Chapter 27 begins with Jesus being handed over to Pilate, the death of, of Judas after his betrayal, and then Jesus before Pilate understanding fully what was about to take place and understanding the Father's plan. And yet he spoke not a word. And then he took the place of Barabbas. And while Satan may have been thinking of success in destroying Jesus, he did not comprehend or understand what we're going to sing about next. And the next hymn is number 290. And I'd like for you to stand together as we sing the power of the cross. Let's stand together as we sing now.
Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. When they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! Then they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to be crucified. Now as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they had come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, place of a skull, they gave him sour wine mingled, mingled with gall to drink. But when he had tasted it, he would not drink. Then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there. And they put up over his head the accusation written against him, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and another on the left. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests, also mocking with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he is the King of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. The final events of the uh, crucifixion are depicted so well. And the next hymn we're going to sing together, remain, remain seated as we do so. God's plan of salvation was put into place. The price for our sins were paid in full. It is finished. Let's sing that together now. It is finished, number 299.
wonderful thing it is to be able to look at the cross of Christ and recognize that he died for me. He died for my sins. And on the cross, he said, it is finished. And it was, and it is. I hope you know the Lord as your personal savior. It's finished. There's nothing more that you need to do. There's nothing more that I need to do. How could we come to God with our sins and, and try to give him some type of good work when it's marred by our own sinful hearts and sinful deeds. It is only the blood of Christ. It's only the death of Christ. It's only the Son of God who took our place. It's that sacrifice which is pleasing to God. And I hope that tonight you know him as your personal Savior, that you've come to a point in your life where you're not trusting your good deeds to outweigh your bad deeds, you are trusting Jesus in his work for you. It is finished, he cried. At this time, we're going to reflect in a special way. That's what we're doing already. This whole service is a reflection and remembrance of him. But at this point in the service, we want to partake of the Lord's Supper, the Lord's table. What is this not? This is not a re-offering of the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are some who would teach that you come together and you take the juice and you take the, the bread and it somehow becomes the body of the Lord Jesus, but that is not what the Bible teaches. Let me read some scripture to you from Hebrews chapter 10. It says, And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us. For after he said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. You see, Jesus' sacrifice is so perfect and so powerful that it pays for all of our sins. So why would we need to offer another sacrifice if we have a sacrifice which pays it all? We don't. So then why are we participating in the Lord's Supper or the Lord's Table if we don't need this as a sacrifice? Well, we read this in, he, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. This text tells us that our observance of the Lord's table is a remembrance of Christ's sacrifice. This is a memorial This is symbolic. We are looking at the juice and the bread, and we are reminding ourselves that his body was broken for us. His blood was shed for our sins. We're not offering him anew. This is simply bread and juice. But we are looking back to the perfect sacrifice of Christ. And as often as we do this, we proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Jesus Christ died, he took our sins upon him, and yet one day he is going to return, and every eye that looks for him, he'll appear the second time apart from sin unto salvation. Friend, are you looking at yourself and your good deeds, or are you looking at the finished work of Christ and faith at what he has done for you? The scripture tells us in 1 Corinthians that when we come to the Lord's table, we need to come in a worthy manner. Now, none of us are worthy of the blood and body of the Lord. We're unworthy. That's why we needed him to take our place. And yet it's possible to come in an unworthy manner. Some of those described were coming thoughtlessly for others. They were sinning against one another, and yet they were partaking of the Lord's Supper. For me to approach the Lord's Supper tonight, I should come with a heart that examines myself And says, Lord, how awful would it be for me to celebrate your sacrifice for sins while tolerating some sin in my own life? In just a moment, I'm going to ask our pianist to play through both hymns. O sacred head, now wounded. Hallelujah. What a savior. During this time, um, we're not going to sing. We're just going to personally reflect and spend time with the Lord. Christian, if there's not something right in your life, If there's some sin, it is inappropriate for you to approach the Lord's table without confessing that and making that right. Friend, perhaps you don't have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Why don't you take this time and call out to him and accept him as your personal Lord and Savior? Salvation is free. It is easy because it was hard for Jesus and he paid it all. As the pianist plays... Why don't you talk to the Lord? If you need to trust him as your savior, do that. Christ alone. If you need to do business with God in some way, do that. And then we'll come together again.
if you've trusted Christ and his sacrifice for your salvation. And if you're walking with him in obedience, you're welcome to join us this evening as we celebrate the Lord's table. In a moment, I'm going to pray. And then if you'll take that small communion cup, um, make certain that you have the red juice on the bottom because we're going to open the top. In fact, let's go ahead and do that. Open the top, which has the wafer. If you do not have this already and you'd like to participate, just lift up your hand. We'll be able to get you one. Let's pray, and then I'll read the scripture, and then we'll partake. Father, O oh, sacred head now wounded. Lord, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Father, we do not deserve any mercy. We deserve to be on that cross. We deserve to suffer your wrath for our sins in hell. And yet Christ, though he was rich, yet for our sakes became poor, that we through his poverty might be made rich. Father, we come to you. We thank you for the body and blood of our Lord Jesus. Thank you that with his once for all sacrifice, our sins are paid for and our salvation is purchased. May all who hear this tonight know you as their personal Savior. If they have not yet trusted you, Lord, may tonight be the night that they turn to Jesus and trust what he did and has done for them. In Christ's name we pray, amen. The scripture says, Now when he had given thanks, he broke it, referring to the bread, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. If you will take the juice, open that. Scripture says, in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Hallelujah. What a Savior. That's right. Jesus, keep me near the cross. Let's stand together as we sing number 313.
The last scripture reading for the evening comes from Matthew chapter 27, verses 45 through 66. Now from the sixth hour into the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there when they heard that said, this man's calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and the earth quaked and the rocks were split. The graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. And many women who followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, were there looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. Now when evening had come, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be given to him. When Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock, and he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. And Mary Magdalene was there and the other Mary sitting opposite the tomb. On the next day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together to Pilate saying, Sir, we remember while he was still alive how that deceiver said, after three days I will rise. Therefore, command that the tomb be made secure until the third day lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people, he is risen from the dead. So the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard. Go your way. Make it as secure as you know how. So they went, made the tomb secure in sealing the stone and setting the guard. What an amazing story, the death of Christ. This uh, Sunday morning at 8 o'clock and 10.30, I'll be preaching from this point, picking the story up with the five resurrection appearances of Christ on the first day of the week. Uh, historic evidence of the reality that he lives and was resurrected. This past Sunday, uh, one of our dear sisters went out the door after the morning service, and then she got out to her car and she did a U-turn, and she came back into the church. I was greeting people in the lobby. <laughs> And uh, she said, uh, this might be a dumb question, but it's been bothering me. And I just had to turn around and, and ask you, why, why do they call Friday Good Friday? She said, there were so many horrible things that were going on on that day. What's Good Friday? And um, I thought about that. And um, I'll just share just a, couple, just a couple thoughts maybe to answer that question for you as I tried to answer it. For her. There was a lot of things that happened on that Friday. I believe Jesus died on, on Friday, I believe in that tradition. Uh, I believe he died in the year 30 AD. I believe he died in the month in the Gregorian calendar in April. I believe he died on the day April 7th. And I believe he died at 3 o'clock on that Passover day. 
If you knew your Bible, if you knew Leviticus 23, if you knew Daniel 9 and Nehemiah 1, it predicts those various events. It, it speaks of the very year, the month, the day, and the very hour was predicted about the death of Christ. It's remarkable. But there's a lot of things that happen that day. When, you're, when one of your best friends betrays you, that is not good. When uh, you have over 500, perhaps 600 soldiers coming to arrest you, that's not good. The Bible says, and while yet spoke, while yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the 12, came, and with him a great multitude of swords and staves. John writes about it in the word, he uses the word cohort. That's one-tenth of a legion, a legion of 6,000 people. There were 600 Roman soldiers that came out to arrest him that night. That's 12 to 1 odds. There was, a, there was 12 with the 11 disciples in Jesus. So 50, 50 soldiers per man. Uh, certainly overkill with the SWAT team. This is not good. They laid hands on Jesus, chained him. This isn't good. They led him to Annas, the godfather of Israel, where in that interrogation, one of the officers struck him with the palm of his hand. This is not good. Uh, from there, he was led to Caiaphas, the acting high priest, and uh, he was there mistreated brutally. This is not good. It was there in that context. They lied about him. They brought false witnesses before Jesus. They wanted to trump the charge, trump up the charges to, to prove that he was a blasphemer. They lied about him. This is not good. That evening, he was kept in a cistern. I've been in that cistern. That's not good. Before he was put in the cistern for the evening, waiting to the morning to make the kangaroo court somewhat official when daylight would come, they spit in his face. They buffeted him. They smote him in the palms of their hands. They blindfolded him. And while blindfolded, and while they smote him, they said, Who's, who did it? You're the prophet. This was not good. Three times that night, Peter would deny Jesus. Here's a follower of Jesus, the leader of the apostles, who under oath said, I swear to God, I don't know the man. That's not good. A whole night in that prison cell. The next morning, bound, he was delivered to Pontius Pilate, the acting Roman governor. They changed the narrative to try to, to, to put before the governor that this man is not only a blasphemer, Pilate could care less about that, but he was treasonous. He was no friend of Caesar. They tried to, to get him on that charge that this was not good. Judas, the treasurer of the apostolic band on this day, commits suicide, sad. This is not good. Pilate tries to get rid of the hot potato, sends them to Herod, hearing that Herod was in town. He was the tetrarch over the region of Galilee. Jesus was a Galilean. Jesus is sent to Herod. Jesus doesn't say a word. They mock him. They put him in a gorgeous robe or a robe and send him back to Pilate. This is not good. Mocked as a king. The governor at the feast gives the Jewish nation an option would they like to release Jesus or Barabbas, a notable prisoner, a terrorist? And the crowd manipulated, yet still cried out for the release of Barabbas. This is not good. They then scourged Jesus. Many a man died by the scourging. The Romans had some limitation to scourgings, 40 minus one lashings. But this wasn't a Jewish scourging, it was a Roman scourging. With Romans, there was no limit. He was scourged. This is not good. They stripped him of his clothes and they platted a crown of thorns upon his head and, and, and put a reed in his right hand, simulating a, a king's scepter and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. This is not good. They smote him on the head. They drove those thorns into his brow. This is not good. They forced him to carry his own cross to a crucif crucifixion site outside the northern walls. This is not good. He would fall under the weight of the cross and under the devastation of the scourging. This is not good. And once at Golgotha, they would nail him to a cross. <laughs> and four soldiers at the base of his feet would gamble for what <laughs> clothing he had left. Tragic. Fulfilling scripture, yes. 
but from a human viewpoint, cruel, evil, mean. As you view the cross from a human perspective, it just, it just undermines how wicked we are, how, how fallen mankind is, how we're not good. So why do we call it Good Friday when such travesties of justice took place and such horrific treatment of an innocent just man? Why do we call it good? I think you look through the cross and you listen to the words of Jesus. When you hear his words, you realize what is good. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. <laughs> That's good. Because the basis of all of our forgiveness is what Christ was doing there on the cross. He's going to pay for our sins. The payment's taken care of. Now we just have to accept that payment that has been paid for by Jesus, by faith. That's good. When it comes there to the cross, that tender care of his mother, Mary, he says the apostle John, the one that loved him the most, he said, John, this is your mother. Mother, this is your son. The care of a, of a parent while being crucified, it just magnifies the character, the type of man Jesus was, the God-man. This, this is good. This is good. And then he said to that thief who repented, uh, when he said, remember me when thou comest into your kingdom, and Jesus said, there on the cross, today thou shalt be with me in paradise in heaven. That's really good. And then he cries out to God, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That wasn't good for Jesus, but it was good for us, for Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice, his life for our sins. And there on the cross, when he cries, finally, <laughs> it is finished. That's good. For what sin of yours and what sin of mine was not paid for at that moment? Any sin you've committed, any sin I will commit, all of our, lump, all of our sin lumped together, it was all paid for in full right there. All of it. That's really good. Because our biggest problem is sin. The wages of sin, the Bible says, is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So this is good. He died there for our sins. He, he paid the, the ultimate price. And he cries out, it is finished. That's really good. So from the viewpoint of what Christ did for us, it's all good. What man did to him, it was all likely largely bad. So we view this day as Good Friday because we had a good Savior who died for all of our sin there on the cross. And he offers pardon, forgiveness, remission of sins to all of us, to those who repent and put their faith in Jesus Christ and him alone. That's really good. And that's what Good Friday is all about. And we hope that every one of you have called out in faith to the Lord and asked him to save you, to forgive you, to, to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And if you've called on the Lord in faith and you've been wonderfully born into his family, that's good. And we have a good Savior. Let's bow for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening, how refreshing it is to have some nice weather, to come out to church, where over the past year we've been told that the church is not essential. And Lord, perhaps we're not essential as people, but Christ is essential. The message of the gospel is essential. The free gift of salvation in Christ is essential. And so Lord, it is so good to be in, the, in your house tonight. Thank you for people who've come out from our church family and our friends and folks from the community. What a blessing to come out and to worship you today on Good Friday. Lord, we've tried uh, to have a good service to exalt Christ, to see him preeminent. And so, Lord, hide us behind the cross. May Christ increase. May we decrease. May our love for Christ only grow. Lord, thank you for this evening. Thank you for each person who's come here. You know every need, every heart, every person. And, Lord, I pray that they would come to you if they've never been saved on this good Friday. I pray now these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Folks, wonderful to have you out tonight. If you're visiting, if you have a moment, just slip by. The Welcome Center's out there to the right in the lobby. Uh, we have a gift for you. We'd love to say hi to you. Uh, for those who are back visiting, some of our college students, wow, is it great to see you uh, out. Look forward to hearing a little bit about how your spring semester is going. 
Uh, Carol Wofford, I keep looking over to see you. Boy, is it good to have you out uh, and others who've come out this evening. Uh, what a blessing to have some folks out. have been out for over a year, and we're just thrilled to have you in this service. The Lord bless you. Thank you for coming. You are dismissed. Thank you.